All right, so today, is there any way we can dim the lights in the front, or do they all have to stay on? Great. So uh, the title of the talk is Direct and Indirect Invasive Lionfish in the Northern Gulf of Mexico and Their Potential Mitigation. Um, before I get going, I just wanted to... Advance the slide. <laughs> Press the down arrow should, should work on the keyboard. I just did, it gave me the same ding. <laughs> Clicker didn't work either. It was working. It's on. Yeah. <laughs> So the mouse work. The mouse works. Now the arrows work. Just do a sign. So okay. Should work now. Should try that. Let's try that. Yep. It's perfect. All right. Thanks. All right. Okay. Well, before we get going, I just want to point out that whatever I say today is I'm responsible for. But the work actually done by these young folks, uh, graduate students who have worked in my lab over the past several years. And, and really, Kristen and Brian, the bulk of the lionfish research is their uh, dissertation and master's um, thesis research. And so I, I know many of you from interactions either with Sea Image or working on other things together or in the management community, working with the guys next door at FWRI. But I thought I'd just spend a minute and kind of tell you a little bit about the stuff that we work on. So as Jackie indicated, you know, I would say what I am as a, as a fisheries ecologist. But within that, we work on several different types of questions. And these include population and recruitment dynamics, things as simple as age and growth, but also um, recruitment dynamics and, and reef fishes. Population structure and connectivity, so conventional tagging, using um, otolith and then elasmobranch vertebrae as natural markers to look at stock mixing and, and movement dynamics. Um, community structure and trophic ecology. Uh, this has been quite a bit of our work with sea image um, following the Deepwater Horizon spill. But we're interested in, in reef fishes and how they utilize habitat and, and what things drive um, their communities and, and different types of systems. And quite a bit of that with uh, stable isotope um, research. Um, and again, with uh, Isabel and David and, and their various uh, groups um, here, we've done quite a bit of work. And then we also work on some applied fisheries questions. So um, things as mundane as stock assessment, but also challenging assumptions that go into stock assessments, like how... Um, uh, what's the natural mortality of a given fish, which is very difficult to estimate, or um, how does selectivity of fishing gear, can it be estimated empirically, what are the implications of that, or even things like barotrauma and release mortality. So in looking at all this and trying to get an idea, given your uh, diversity here, um, I didn't want to get two fisheries in what I was going to talk about today, so I decided the lionfish question um, would be something that you may relate to from local experience, and then Chris can also correct me when I make mistakes, so that's <laughs> useful. So um, we work on a variety of different species, but a large chunk of the research that my group has done over the past 10 or 15 years has involved reef fishes. And so shown here are uh, images. Um, these are uh, painted fish from Diane Peebles' work. And they have lots of things um, in common among them, although we have a diversity of families and species shown. And many of these animals live a long time, and that makes uh, management very challenging. And many of these are also sex changers. So the groupers in particular, some of the spareds, um, change mostly from female to male as they get older. And so that can make management very challenging. Um, in our region, one of the management devices that have been utilized quite a bit to try to uh, either mitigate fishing effects or to, um, in an attempt to enhance productivity, whether that's possible or not is open to debate, of these animals is to build artificial reefs. And, and so artificial reefs has, have been distributed quite extensively in our region, um, but we don't have a good idea of how these communities differ or are similar between natural and artificial reef habitat. And so we spent quite a bit of time over the past recent years using micro ROV technology to examine differences in community structure and then also to sample fishes to look at things like size at age, um, diet, trophic position, and how they, how they compare between different systems. And so I'm going to show this here instead of talk about methods later to just indicate that um, we utilize the micro ROV. You can see the video, the video array system in the top left. It has a, a laser scaler. You can see the trigger fish in the top right that has the two lasers, um, dots, 
on it broadside that we can utilize to estimate the length of fish. On small artificial reef structures like this, we use a modified Bonesack and Banero point count methodology to estimate community structure, count fish um, throughout the water column. And then on more dis dis uh, dispersed natural reef habitat, we use transect methods. Um, and so we, um, given that we know these two angles, um, we can, the angle of the camera view and the angle um, of the uh, incidence of the camera to the seabed from perpendicular, we can estimate the, the width of the transect that we're viewing with, uh, with the ROV. So these are the methods. When I talk about lionfish densities in different habitats, this is the tool that we utilize to make those estimates. So in this system, we have natural reefs and artificial reefs. And this is a good example of a natural reef off of Destin um, in the panhandle of Florida. And so you'll notice that the, the habitat is very complex, very rich, diverse invertebrate community and lots of small little reef fishes, damsels, uh, gobies, blennies um, that can hide in the, in the, in the different uh, interstices uh, of, the, of the reef. Um, we have uh, angel fishes, butterfly fishes. Uh, here we have grunts and there's some snappers and groupers in the background. So we have a, a complex habitat and quite a diversity of species that exist in this habitat. And a typical artificial reef looks more similar to this. And so this is actually the fuselage and landing gear of, an, of a, what remains of an aircraft, here's part of a wing, that was purposefully sunken as an artificial reef about 15 years before this video was taken in 2012. And so here you'll notice that the, the structure of this habitat is, is not as complex, um, and we don't have a lot of the small reef fishes. There's some big eyes here in the background, but that small diver, demersal reef fish community typically isn't present on these, on these types of habitats. But we do have large fishes like snappers, um, both grays and, and reds shown here, some vermilion snappers swimming through. Um, gray trigger fish, obviously a sea turtle here. Uh, but this is more typical of what we see on artificial reefs, more fishery species. And in fact, artificial reefs are principally um, deployed in our region to, uh, as fishing gear. Um, we, we can talk about the, the, the true um, function of them, but, but they really function mostly as fishing gear. Um, not, um, not for other purposes. So in our work, um, we've studied you know, extensive areas of the shelf uh, for about 10 years. Um, but in 2010, as we were examining impacts of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, we witnessed these animals for the first time in our region. They showed up off the coast here about a year earlier, uh, but invasive lionfish. Um, and so. I'm sure that many of you either directly or indirectly have quite a bit of experience with these guys. The, the press um, obviously has reported extensively and obviously there's quite a bit of research ongoing here um, on the West Florida Shelf as well in the Keys about invasive lionfish. Uh, but this animal, uh, Terrace volatans, um, again first appeared in our area in 2010 and what's interesting about this, this animal obviously is that it has venomous spines that are deterrent to predation. Um, and it's also uh, not recognized as a native predator by the small demersal fishes that it feeds upon, um, as well as invertebrates. And, and so again, this animal first showed up in 2010, but very rapidly, the densities of lionfish in our system um, increased exponentially. And so we have several questions about how these animals are um, affecting and uh, impacting the region um, and these reef fish communities. Um, and so that's going to be the basis uh, of what, what I'll talk about today. As far as, as far as the trends over time, so lionfish are thought to have been introduced through the aquarium trade here in southeast Florida. So this is a tracker by USGS that starts in the mid-80s. And you can see the, they move up the east coast uh, of Florida into the Carolinas um, here in Bermuda. We have some summertime strays into the upper mid-Atlantic and then into the Caribbean. Um, by 2009 here into the Gulf of Mexico and now they've extended all the way around and completed the loop here. So we have questions about what are the impacts of these animals in the system. Um, in the Caribbean, you know, quite a bit of work by um, Hickson and Green and others has shown they can have pretty substantial impacts to the fauna uh, of, of native reef fishes um, in tropical regions. And so this sort of perception of lionfish as this super alien, this is <laughs> an image from uh, the Sci-Fi Channel, has sort of been perpetuated um, by the media and, and even the scientific community. 
Um, and our, one of our questions is, you know, are these animals really this super alien invader? Um, or perhaps, as shown here to the right in the context of the size distribution of, of other mesopredators in the system, are we just adding another mesopredator to the system? You know, what, what makes this animal unique or, or just distinctive? And so what are research questions? Um, one, what are the habitat-specific trends in northern Gulf of Mexico lionfish density and biomass across time? Two, are there habitat-specific differences in lionfish population demographics in the northern Gulf of Mexico? Three, what are the direct and indirect effects of lionfish on native reef fishes in the system? And I'll talk quite a bit about this today. And then lastly, are targeted removals effective for removing lionfish densities, reducing lionfish densities, and mitigating their effects? Um, there's been quite a bit of, of work done with this, um, especially with, with dive groups, and encouraging citizens not only to take a role in the science of tracking lionfish, but also um, to have positive impacts in removing them from the system. And so one of our questions is how effective is that and how can we perhaps enhance it? So, some specifics. The study region here, so we have the northern Gulf of Mexico, right? So in this region here, uh, where I live is right here, or where I work on Dolphin Island Sea Lab, and obviously we're right here um, to give you some spatial context. We have a series of natural and artificial reefs that we've been studying, some of which back to the mid-2000s. And so we have a long time series of community structure, so what animals live there, how big they are, how fast they grow. Um, and you can see they're spread across the shelf from about 15 meters out to about 85 meters depth. And then in this polygon here, this is the Escambia East large area artificial reef site off Pensacola. And so this is an area the state has built uh, a bunch of reefs in the mid-2000s and didn't report their coordinates to the public. So quite a bit of our work has been done there. And just as a reminder, right, we have quite different communities in these two different habitats. Much higher diversity um, and many more small reef fishes in the natural reef habitat. So across time, again, these are estimates derived from our micro ROV surveys. Here we have lionfish per 100 square meters on the y-axis and then year. So 2010, um, we observed lionfish and natural reefs, but only a few. They don't even show up here uh, given the scale. And then on artificial reefs, we don't have any data in the system. One thing to note about these two panels at the top, however, is that the scales are quite different. This goes from zero to one fish per 100 square meters. The error bars are 95% confidence limits. And then this goes from zero to 50 on artificial. So on artificial reefs, the densities are a couple of orders of magnitude higher than on the natural bottom, which may seem a bit counterintuitive because the book on lionfish is that they prefer to eat these small demersal reef fishes, yet those animals don't really exist at high densities on artificial reefs. But we see much higher densities of them in that, in that region. These densities are similar but higher than what we see in patch reefs in the Caribbean. So if you think of an artificial reef that's on an open substrate, it operates very similar to a patch reef in tropical regions. If we look at um, total length, the mass versus length, and then mean mass of the animals across time, not only do we have this exponential increase in numbers, right, but we have this uh, linear increase in total length based on the relationship between mass and length, then we get this exponential increase in the mean mass of the animals. So not only are they growing exponentially as a population, but the individual mean size is also growing exponentially. So this has potential to have big impacts in the system. We're interested in this difference in density between natural and artificial reefs. And so here we have males and females. Um, and, and I'm showing you here condition factors. So we take that weight length relationship and compute an index um, referred to as condition. Right, and so here we have the relative con condition factor um, K, sub N. And here we have sampling season. So we go from spring through winter and males versus females. And the reason that we depict these separately is because their weight length relationships are significantly different from one another. The females are heavier bodied than the males. And so what we see is that in green here, we have natural reefs and in blue are artificial. Um, and again, these are 95% confidence limits. All the error bars that I'll show are in this talk are 95% confidence limits. And so what you note here is that the, the animals, both the males and the females on the natural sites have a higher condition factor. That means they're heavier per, um, per length than, uh, or fatter 
uh, on natural sites than on the higher density artificial reefs. So we have this density dependent condition. Um, we've also done, started to do quite a bit of work aging these animals with otoliths. Um, and of the 3,000 or so otoliths that we've collected, we've only aged about 500. But in that preliminary assessment, in fact, the growth rates are slower on the artificial habitat as well. So we spent uh, a couple of years, this is part of Kristen Dahl's dissertation work, examining what they're eating in this system to try to get a sense of what are their you know, bioenergetic impacts to the native communities. So you can see there's a broad range of animals that were collected, and this is um, the, the animals that were shot off of two of these artificial reef modules. Um, so Kristen has these ranked, and she'll systematically randomly sample them. Um, she performed stomach content analysis on nearly 1,000 fish, about 934, and this was from spring of 2013 through winter of 2014. Of the stomachs that she examined, and these animals were all shot with spears by divers, 95% um, of the natural reef stomachs had prey, and 81% of the artificial reef stomachs had prey present. So um, that's sort of a qualitative index to us about how effective these animals are as predators. Typically, we see 30 to 40 percent of the reef fishes we sample in the system actually have prey present in their stomachs, right? So we, wanna, we don't want to put too much emphasis on that, um, but these animals, almost, you know, a, a, a vast majority of the animals that we sampled actually had prey present. Forty-three percent of the, of the prey that we observed, we could identify visually, so the stomachs were preserved in ethanol, um, and then later the taxa were identified. So of these, we have 75 different taxa, and of those 75, 29 could be identified to species. And so we have a diversity of animals present in their guts, right? Here's a juvenile damselfish. Here's a pearly razor, a small wrasse. This is a recreationally and commercially important vermilion snapper. Um, and then here's a, a two-spot cardinal fish, uh, cephalopods, crabs, and shrimps. So actually quite a diversity of prey present, not all fishes um, in their stomachs. And this key is something that I'll carry forward um, in the next few slides. So in, in Kristen's diet um, paper, so we have um, mean mass um, as a percent of diet, and then the summer, spring, or excuse me, spring, summer, fall, and winter samples. The size class is here, so we have natural and artificial reefs, and the size class is small, or S, is less than 200 millimeters. The medium is 200 to 250 millimeters and then the large is greater than 250 millimeters total length. Um, and so you'll note first these gray bars. These gray bars were unidentifiable, visually unidentifiable fishes in the stomachs of lionfish. Um, the green bars, these are, the dark green, these are reef fishes that are present. And then the, the navy blue here, these are pelagic fishes. And then we have a series of different invertebrates. And the pink shows up most extensively, and those are shrimp. So what we see is there's a significant difference in diet between habitats and among size classes, um, and also the seasonal effect is significant. On the natural reefs, we might ex have expected this, we have a much larger percentage of the diet, uh, the visually identifiable diet, is actually these small demersal reef fishes. And that follows because the diversity of these animals in those, in those habitats is much higher. Um, and then we have Non-reef fishes in the light blue, right, and pelagic fishes in the navy blue showing up to a greater extent on the artificial habitat. So these non-reef fishes are things like flounders and sea robins, animals that live on the open substrate, but the lionfish then have to leave the reef to go find them. So they're foraging away from the reef. And then all of these different invertebrates, shrimps and crabs, are, are the um, largest um, um, by percentage here. There are also benthic invertebrates that are non-reef associated animals. But we see this pattern um, of a large percentage of our um, data being visually unidentifiable. So that's a concern to us. What we, what we can infer from this is that over time, well, there's a difference in habitat. We have more invertebrates and non-reef fishes and artificial reefs. But then as we move into fall and winter, we're getting more invertebrates in the diet of these animals, both on the natural reefs and the artificial habitats. Why might this be? Well, the densities are increasing across time. The size of the animals is increasing across time. They're down the available prey. And then we have white shrimp moving across the shelf in this time period. So perhaps that's a prey availability as well. 
So what do we do about these unidentifiable prey? Um, when, we, when we look at the stomach contents, we have some animals that are easily identifiable. We have some that are possibly identifiable. And then we have uh, animals that are too digested to identify visually. And so the approach that we've taken to identify these is to use DNA barcoding. So by storing these in, in ethanol, we have, that, we have that ability. So basically, the way this process works is you take this unidentifiable, um, visually unidentifiable tissue using sterile conditions, um, cut into it, extract DNA from the center or extract tissue, right? You process that for PCR, amplify the, the uh, apply primers to amplify this, this gene, right, the cytochrome oxidase 1 mitochondrial gene, um, which is a, about a 650 base pair region of the mitochondrial genome. And um, then that's sequenced, put through a database. So we have a couple of different databases available. There's um, BOLD, the Barcode um, of Life database, and GenBank. Um, and so animals like this two-spot cardinal fish that were sampled earlier and their tissues, um, uh, their sequences, um, their CO1 sequences submitted to these various databases, um, then enable us to be able to distinguish that animal from <coughs> others uh, once we've amplified and sequenced the DNA. Now, the great thing about this particular gene is that among species, it's 99 point some percent conservative. So we can take lionfish from the Indo-Pacific, we can take lionfish from the Caribbean, red lionfish, um, and we can have the same high um, accuracy in, in barcoding them to species and not confusing them with other um, either uh, scorpionids, um, other uh, congeners, or snappers and groupers, for example. So it's a very strong marker, very accurate marker. Well, this figure shows um, a couple of things. The panel at the top, we have number of prey taxa, and then across the x-axis, we have lionfish stomachs. And so the green, again with 95% confidence intervals, right? So these are species, or, uh, yeah, um, species accumulation curves for the diet um, of lionfish. And so the green here is without barcoding. And you can see that this more or less is reaches an asymptote, which is what we're looking for, right? So that tells us that we've sampled an adequate number of stomachs to characterize the diet. We thought given the shape of this curve, it was unlikely by doing the barcoding that we were going to add a whole lot of new taxa to our estimates. But if you look at the blue here, we actually have a similar shape, but we've added quite a few unique taxa uh, 